Our final presentation today is another musculoskeletal disorder known as epicondylitis and is presented jointly between ergonomist Daryl Stevenson and physician Dr. Mike Plisklevix. Thanks a lot uh, for coming uh, to this great event that, that we have every year. Uh, it's always exciting to see how many countries that are involved and, and people. Uh, and Trevor does a great job, you know, organizing this uh, with the rest of us. So today I'm going to be talking uh, about epicondylitis and workplace factors. And this is a presentation that myself and Dr. Mike put together uh, and, and worked back and forth with each other on. And he's hopefully going to be coming in uh, around noon hour, so you can ask some questions to him after. But I'll be uh, going through the presentation myself. Okay, so I'm going to start by examining uh, the anatomy involved in epicondylitis and focus on the structures around the elbow and the wrist. And then we'll get into some of the symptoms and the diagnostic methods used to identify epicondylitis. Uh, we'll explore some of the underlying mechanisms, so mainly tendonitis and tendinosis, and discuss some of the risk factors contributing to the development of it. Uh, we'll touch upon uh, some recent research from the field of epicondylitis and highlight some advancements and insights. And we'll discuss some various treatments that are available and, and strategies for prevention. So overall, the presentation aims to provide a comprehensive view uh, of epicondylitis and, and cover its various aspects to equip you with a better understanding of the, of the condition. So what is epicondylitis? Epicondylitis refers to a degenerative condition that affects the bones, <coughs> sorry, that affects the tendons attached to the elbows epicondyles. And these are bony projections at the humerus's lower end, just above the elbow joint. And these epicondyles serve as attachment points for several of the forearm muscles. At these muscles, or at these points, the muscles blend together and are collectively referred to as common origins due to the shared connection. And the common extensor origin is the muscle group attached to the lateral uh, outer epicondyle, uh, while the common flexor origin is the link to the medial or inner epicondyle. So the contracting muscles will pull on the tendon and can increase the amount of force that's placed where it attaches to the bone. And this condition leads to pain and discomfort in the elbow region. So lateral epicondylitis affects about 1 to 3% of the population aged 35 to 55. Uh, medial was less than 1%, it's less studied, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. It is the most common cause of musculoskeletal pain in the elbow. And one interesting fact is that more than 50% of non-professional tennis players uh, suffer from this disease, but only 5% of professional tennis players complain about it. And this affects up to 17% of factory workers, as well as meat processors, or anyone who has highly repetitive and similar hand movements. So jobs like typists, artists, musicians, electricians, mechanics, uh, many others that can be affected. And in the WSIB uh, last year in Ontario, there were 359 accepted claims, uh, 39 average days lost. And I took a look back over the last 10 years, you can go back to 2012. And, and in 2012, there were 644 with 112 average days lost. And it did look like it was steadily going down over time um, up until now. So the two forms are uh, distinguished as lateral epicondylitis and medial epicondylitis, and they're commonly referred to as tennis elbow for lateral and golfer's elbow for medial. Uh, and it appears from the literature that the medial epicondylitis is markedly less common than lateral epicondylitis. And as a result, its work relatedness has not been uh, separately examined in, in quite as much detail. And in some studies, the authors refer to epicondylitis without really specifying what form it takes uh, but based on the context these papers are generally studying lateral the underlying assumption seems to be that providing the relevant muscle groups are engaged the causative factors and the resulting possibility of medial epicondylitis being work related are basically identical to those for lateral epicondylitis so we can see here uh, the anatomy of the elbow and the forearm the wrist and the hand and these pictures have the site of the lateral and medial epicondylitis shown, and they have the muscles and the tendons that connect with them displayed. Uh, and then they have the ones that don't connect with them uh, removed so that you can kind of see which are the flexor tendons and the or the flexor muscles and the extensors. 
So we can see on both sides just how many muscles and tendons connect with them in that same spot. And there's actually about three layers of these muscles, um, so it's probably not showing everything. Uh, and there are many movements and activities that can activate any of these muscles. But it really just highlights how many of these come and, and land on that same point. So these muscles are involved with rotational movements of the forearms. They enable the turning of the forearms inward, so like a palm downward orientation known as pronation, uh, originating from the medial epicondyle, and then to an outward palm up position uh, that emanates from the lateral epicondyle. Additionally, the, the elbows bending and straightening actions are governed by the biceps um, for flexion and the triceps for extension. The behavior of the, the various muscles is, is made even more complex because they are also engaged during movements of the opposite to those mentioned. So they function as either a direct antagonist. So imagine uh, basically gently loosening a rope on one side of a tent pole while simultaneously, simultaneously pulling on the other side or by providing stability to the other joints. So for instance, uh, when flexing the fingers, the wrist extensors contract actively to prevent the wrist from bending during this action. So if you can just take your hand with me just to demonstrate this and, and wave your hand like you're trying to fan air at somebody. And now at the same time, curl your fingers in like you're creating like a claw flex position and try to do the same thing with your wrist. And you can see how much it locks up due to your fingers uh, being flexed. So these small muscles originating from these areas have a secondary role in, in bending the elbow and keeping the elbow joint stable by ma maintaining the proximity of the ulna to the humerus. So from this, we can see that it's clear that while the pain of either type of epicondylitis is localized at the elbow. The movements that typically correlate with this pain are predominantly related to the wrist and the fingers. So if you take one hand and grab your other forearm just below where those two epicondyles start, to, or if you can feel those, and then grab just below where you can feel your muscles, and then just basically move your fingers and your hand around in different ways, and you can really feel how much it's activating in that area. And you can see if you create a strong wrist extension upwards, it really activates that outer area. So there are several muscles that extend along the forearm and connect to the hand and the wrist and the humerus. And these are shown in the above pictures. And the one on the left just shows, again, the extensor muscles at that lateral site. But as we can see on the right, all of these muscles extend out into the tendons of the hand and finger. And if you pull on, if you use your hand and fingers, these muscles contract and subsequently place forces on the tendons at the opposite end. The main functions of the wrist uh, are extension, so bending the wrist backwards like a push-up, oops, like a push-up position, uh, and wrist flexion, so the wrist bends forward, bringing the palm down. Imagine curling your hand downward. And these muscles uh, from these common origins also have other functions. So as well as wrist extension, uh, the muscles of the lateral epicondyle pull the wrist sideways towards the little finger, and this is known as ulnar deviation, and then towards the thumb as radial deviation. Other muscles with the same common origin also extend the fingers, and from the medial epicondyle, muscles generally act in reverse direction, flexion of the wrist and fingers. However, they also contribute to both deviations of the wrist. The symptoms for lateral and medial epicondylitis involve the tenderness, uh, pain and tenderness, really, which starts from the epicondyles and then can spread down to the forearm and possibly the middle and ring fingers. Grasping items may make the pain worse and you may have less strength overall when doing so. Uh, with lateral epicondylitis, there's gonna be pain when bending the wrist backwards, turning the palm upwards and holding something with a stiff or straightened elbow. And the elbow can feel stiff and the forearm muscles can feel tight with these conditions. With medial epicondylitis, the pain will be found when bending the wrist and then twisting your forearm down. For diagnosis, your, your doctor will first take a detailed medical history. So I'm gonna click this video a few more times. Trevor, Trevor made some of these, any of the videos in here, Trevor made for me and the, they're pretty neat. So I'm showing the, the pain at the elbow site. So during a physical examination, the doctor may position the, the wrist and the arm so you feel a stretch on the forearm and the tendons, which is usually painful, or do a similar test for strengths. Uh, X-rays may be taken to aid the doctor to rule out any other issues uh, or MRIs, uh, and ultrasounds can be used to show any problem with collagen degeneration. 
So elbow pain can stem from various conditions and it's similar to how symptoms can also indicate. Uh, so, similarly, uh, symptoms may also indicate other underlying issues, such as radial tunnel syndrome and cubital tunnel syndrome. So, lateral epicondyle symptoms are very similar to radial tunnel syndrome. And this condition is caused by pressure on the radial nerve as it crosses the elbow. And medial epicondylitis symptoms are similar uh, to a condition called cubital tunnel syndrome. And these conditions are caused by pinched ulnar nerve as it crosses the elbow on its way to the hand. So, just to look at what these tendons are made up of, and the, both the extensor and the flexor tendon are comprised of collagen. And collagen strands are lined up in the tendon and have high tensile strength. So, they can withstand a high forces being pulled on both ends of the tendon. Uh, when the muscles work, they pull on one end of the tendon, and then the other end pulls on the bone, causing it to move. So, there are three categories of, of collagen fiber bundles, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And, and the main point is that in a healthy tendon, these collagen fibers are highly ordered and they're very uh, in line and parallel and, and, and work together. Uh, there's a lower overall metabolic rate for tendons compared to muscles. So while they are stronger and have that increased tension capacity, they have slower healing post injury. So epicondylitis involves the degeneration of the origin of the tendons at the epicondyle. The degeneration of the tendon, called tendinosis, uh, is observed microscopically as the disruption of collagen fibers and disorganized repair. So, the exact cause of tendinosis remains unclear, but some suggest that excessive activity leads to micro tears in the tendon. So, when the rate of stretching of a tendon exceeds the tolerance of the tendon, a micro tear can result. Uh, and the adaptation of the tendons to multiple micro tears can lead to tendinosis. While trying to heal, constant strain and overuse keep re-injuring the tendons, and continuous strain and overuse can hinder the tendon healing and leaving scar tissue uh, vulnerable. And it can result in weakness and discomfort. Uh, poor vascularity can make this worse. Uh, and one author did propose another theory that uh, a mechanism involving tendons that possibly may be rubbing on a bony prominence due to an elbow movement. Um, that's why I left a question mark there. Uh, which is also in line with the view that this is a cumulative injury. So, this video can show um, just at the end there, you can see where it attaches and it slowly start to break down. So, just to go over tendonitis and tendinosis, uh, some symptoms like pain, burning sensation, diminished strength, and reduced flexibility are often uh, thought to be caused by acute inflammation of the tendons. However, uh, it's often tendinosis, not tendinitis, that's typically the culprit behind these symptoms. So, understanding the difference between these two is, is important because it dictates the treatment objectives and the expected recovery time. So, the main aim in treating tendinitis is, is to alleviate the inflammation, um, which is not really the factor in tendinosis. So, on top of this, some of the anti-inflammatory treatments, like taking ibuprofen or corticosteroids, um, are believed to interfere with some of the collagen repair and may even exacerbate tendinosis. And there's a slide later that, that shows some studies looking at that. Um, some research has linked this treatment uh, with impeded collagen repair to the heightened risk of tendon rupture. So conversely, the primary goals with managing tendinosis include halting the repetitive injury cycle and promoting the production of uh, and maturation of collagen. And this helps the tendon regain its normal strength. So interestingly, some treatments uh, are often beneficial for both, although for very different reasons. So, something like deep friction therapy uh, may be advantageous for both. It can help reduce adhesions and foster the development of functional scar tissue and tendonitis, while in tendinosis, it may stimulate the, product, uh, the production of collagen. So, nonetheless, uh, the precise assessment techniques and thorough understanding of the condition in question are essential for the, the most effective treatment. So these are, uh, this will get a little bit technical here from, uh, from some of Dr. Mike's stuff, but uh, bear with me to the ne these next two slides here. The, the disruption of the collagen fibers can be seen above uh, and the collagen structure in healthy tendons, you can see on the left there, is more ordered and parallel, whereas the structure uh, in mild and severe lateral epicondylitis has uh, increasing disruption and or disorganization. So it's hypothesized that this disruption of the collagen structure 
is a result of increased cell death. Um, as the tendon is repetitively loaded, the healing process is inhibited by the elevated cell death rate, leading to severe disruption of the collagen structure. Uh, it is still unknown why there is an elevated rate of cell death during this stage in the tendon. And to draw an analogy, if you envision fibers uh, as a strands on a rope, and when the tension is applied, a rope with neatly ordered fibers is going to be more robust and work together. In contrast, a rope with disorganized fibers um, or a, a tendon with disorganized collagen fibers akin to having like knots in it would be weaker and more and cause more pain uh, and just not function as, as well. So some other risk factors diving a little bit even deeper uh, include degenerative, degenerative changes uh, of the tendon and the disruption of the local blood supply in the area. So diving deeper, uh, angiofibroblastic tendinosis is what they refer to when they're talking more about the cellular level uh, issues. And it's specifically referring to the degenerative changes within the tendon characterized by the weakening as a result of the diminished blood supply and damage to the tendon's fibers. And this lack of blood flow can impede the tendon's natural healing process. Uh, and additionally, this degeneration gives rise to this angiofibroblastic tissue, which can disrupt the normal structure of the tendon's fibers. Okay, so now uh, just looking at some overall treatments that are done for epicondylitis, and there are many possible treatments for epicondylitis. Uh, Non-surgical treatment is typically four to six weeks. If the tendinosis is chronic and severe, it can be up to nine months. And I've seen even where they said it can go longer or it can relapse, it can come back. Um, so it can be a long-term issue. Anti-inflammatory medications uh, are used if the inflammation is the issue. Shockwave therapy, uh, ice and electrical stimulation and massage are used to ease muscle pains and spasm. Spasm, sorry. Uh, forearm bands that you might see, you know, a lot of golfers and, and tennis players might wear these. Uh, I actually wore one for a while. They are used basically to dissipate the forces coming into the attachment site at the elbow. So if you can think of the, the pictures back with the anatomy, how many of those are coming to that point on the epicondyles, uh, by creating a pressure point a little bit farther along the muscle, it can kind of dissipate some of the force, and that's basically the idea behind that, as as far as I know. Uh, when when ready, uh, exercises can can be used to strengthen the forearm muscles, uh, and working with physical or occupational therapists can help you uh, by teaching you how to do your activities without putting extra strain on the elbows. Um, yeah, so I did, I did quickly see there, somebody said, what about acupuncture? And that would be on there too. I did see that listed on a few sites, uh, just not in, in the research. So I didn't throw it in there, but for sure. So this is that chart that I was kind of referring to. And this is a combination of two different RCTs uh, that looked at some of the treatments. So if people prefer quick relief symptoms, a corticosteroid injection might be suitable. But for the long-term prognosis, it might be poor. So for, for most patients, a wait and see policy with adequate advice and provision of analgesic drugs will uh, be okay. Uh, for those with severe and persistent problems, uh, physiotherapy might provide an effective and possibly cost-effective alternative. So we can just see here based on this chart um, with the red ones in the middle being the wait and see policy, you can see how um, it's, pretty steady progression in terms of reducing the pain. The cortical steroid in the blue is gonna really reduce the pain um, very quickly, but then over that 12 month period, it had a, had a worse outcome. And then the physiotherapy uh, and doing those strengthening exercises uh, has shown to, to have the better outcomes there. Surgical treatment uh, is seen more as, as a last resort so if it ever gets to that point in time where something needs to be you know, cleaned out or, or adjusted, uh, the two different techniques, tendon debridement and tendon release uh, are the two procedures. Okay. And again, show this neat little video Trevor made. So just going over some, some research, in the UK, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council uh, has explored the potential work-related 
nature of lateral epicondylitis on several occasions. In 1981, they suggested further research into the condition, but in it initially decided against including it in the list of recognized occupational diseases. However, they acknowledged that in certain cases, an occupational link could be demonstrated. Uh, the, the decision was not to imply that work does not cause epicondylitis under any circumstances. Rather, the criteria for an occupational disease required uh, evidence that work in specific jobs or specific exposures increase the risk of developing the disease by at least a factor of two. So that was basically a cutoff that, that decided that. Subsequent reviews by them included one in 1992 uh, and again found no evidence to classify it. Despite one study showing um, a clear cut higher occurrence among meat processing workers, the council noted that the lack of sufficient epidemiological evidence uh, for classification does not deny the work relatedness of some uh, certain upper limb disorders, including carpal tunnel syndrome and potentially lateral epicondylitis. These conditions were seen as resulting from cumulative rather than specific incidents, suggesting that repeated drama could lead to them. In 2006, the review reaffirmed the lack of evidence for the designation. Uh, and in 2015, the final review, they acknowledged that workers face intense and varied ergonomic risks and have significantly higher chance of developing uh, epicondylitis if they do. Yet due to the complexity and the inconsistency in defining the exposures, the IIC refrained from officially recognizing it as an industrial disease. So it does look like the research is, uh, points to it, but can't quite label it due to that restriction. And that last point about the complexity and inconsistency defining the exposures, we're gonna get to in, in a few slides, uh, which is interesting. So just some further research, NIOSH uh, also addressed epicondylitis. They, con they concluded that there was strong evidence for a relationship between an exposure to a combination of risk factors and epicondylitis. So force, repetition, and force and posture. And they found some support in evidence in other fields. So from sport injuries and from what they termed the biological plausibility of the relationship uh, between the proposed causal activities. So in concluding, the author stated that while the studies do not identify the number of uh, the number or intensity of forceful contractions needed to increase the risk of epicondylitis, the levels are likely to be substantial, but no qualification of the term substantial was given. Another review printed uh, in 2009 presented a fresh review of some of the literature and the authors identified what they regarded as consistent evidence um, of statistically significant associations between lateral epicondylitis and forceful work, repetitive work, awkward postures, and combinations of these factors. However, they found that the association with vibration exposure suggested by some studies was not consistent. Uh, in this review, the authors qualify forceful work uh, as associated with handling loads greater than 20 kilograms for at least 10 times a day. So this is the table that I was uh, referring to when I said it's very complex and, and hard to organize all the literature together. And many attempts have been made at, at this. And, and you can see, you read the papers and they start off going for an analysis. And, and this becomes the conclusion that it becomes very difficult. So the table is a list of individual studies and the studies are placed on the left. And I took the factors uh, that they were using as their variables for their exposures and, and put them in the right and tried to combine them as much as I could together. Um, and this is as far as I could get with that. So many of these studies had overlapping factors with no significance. Uh, and I didn't show these in this chart here. And I'm not gonna go through these all. I just wanted to show that there's so many variables that are created by the researchers that it becomes difficult to compare them and combine the results and make any sort of um, prescription for, for how much things can be done or not. And, and and we see that question asked a lot, and I'm pretty sure Sherry got asked something like that for, for posture, but for repetition and, and for force and things like that, a lot of the times the answer is gonna to come to, well, it depends, you know, how much are they doing it? What postures are they using? Um, so there are a lot of factors that go into how much, um, and, and you can see even at the, the highest level with all this research, it's hard to put that together. So there are good reasons for these authors to choose these variables and the factors that they did. And most of them go into good detail in their own context in the studies, uh, showing why they would choose those variables. So just a little bit more with psychosocial risk factors uh, studied by Thies after 
Adjustments for age, gender, BMI, and strain index, there are many significant relationships between psychosocial factors in both lateral and medial epicondylitis. Uh, lateral epicondylitis showed having nine of the 10 um, psychosocial factors with this study. And then uh, the relationships with these factors and medial epicondylitis were similar in direction, but less significant, yet showing many similar trends. So again, many similar trends between uh, the findings from both lateral and medial. So there's been a gradual uh, buildup of, of evidence over the years regarding the extent to which epicondylitis can be regarded as caused by work and what factors it might be. Um, as with other MSDs, uh, non-work factors are always implicated and it's always important to consider the possible role of such factors in exploring the cause of a particular condition. So there does appear to be a general picture of an age-related increase in prevalence which is consistent with the idea that this is a degenerative condition that builds up over time, a cumulative condition. And there does not appear to be a marked gender-related bias um, it, with the prevalence. However, some studies have found it and have some studies have not, but not a definitive one yet. One study examined the relationship between a variety of factors, so obesity, diabetes, smoking, um, and other MSDs. And there is a, an association between lateral epicondylitis and a number of the other conditions, such as rotator cuff conditions, uh, the Quervain's disease, and CTS, as well as oral steroid use. The authors suggested a number of possible explanations for these, uh, especially the shoulder problem, suggesting that there could be physical explanation that those with shoulder problems might, might modify or compensate in their work activities and thus predispose themselves to epicondylitis in some sort of way. And the authors also suggested maybe smoking could, could be possibly due to the explained uh, reduce, reduction in blood flow to the tendon. So to summarize this literature, uh, it's apparent that a number of studies examined the role that work might play in contributing to epicondylitis. Given that this matter is largely considered by observational studies, uh, the methodological consideration uh, needs to be taken into context and it's important for the results. The cohorts provided good generalizability to a range of occupations and societies. Um, specific identification of precise causal biomechanical factors would be ideal, right? If we can break that list down into a, into a few, you know, repetition, force, things like that. Uh, however, there is no consensus on the exposure metrics across the cohorts. And studies measured many different ones, varying from broad subjective categorizations, such as job title, like flower cutter, to specific quantifiable measures, such as degrees of wrist motion. So this makes it very difficult, again, to accurately quantify physical factors that contribute to the risk. So general consideration uh, of this um, non-quantifiable association between physical work factors and lateral epicondylitis risk factors that were studied in the articles were repetitive tasks, forceful movement, wrist bending, rotation, uh, gripping, arms lifted in front of the body, using vibrational tools, tasks requiring precision, strenuous tasks, manual work, and bending of the elbow. So among these exposures, highly repetitive tasks, wrist movement, gripping, strenuous forceful tasks were consistently associated with lateral epicondylitis. Other factors were inconclusive, but some studies uh, demonstrate an association and others do not. Okay, and these factors are biomechanically consistent with the pathophysiology of the forearm musculature. So I just wanted to bring this up. As, as I said something on the last slide, and, and we see this a lot with um, especially musculoskeletal disorders and workplace exposure research. So it's, there's a common, and, and this is from a paper from Laura Punnett, um, from 2014, uh, and this is a paper I like to highlight for, for different reasons, but there's a commonly cited hierarchy in, in health sciences research for ranking the type of research studies, which relies a lot on the design uh, to, de to designate higher quality evidence. This hierarchy uh, usually rates the randomized controlled tri trials uh, or the randomized clinical trials at the top and then the controlled uh, with quasi or no randomization and study designs with a control group more at the bottom. Um, and in fact, the phrase evidence-based medicine has come to represent for, for some that RCTs are the only valid type of study design. Uh, however, it's important to know the differences 
uh, with the different types of research. So for intervention studies that are, that are gonna be commonly using these, the involving comparison of two or more treatments, there's a widespread and, and very understandable preference for RCTs. So if we think about those treatment studies that we looked at in that graph, right? You'd, you'd, you'd want to control for that randomized um, issues and, and people knowing what they're taking and things like that, the biases that could prevent that. But in contrast with, uh, with questions about environmental and occupational agents that are more typically addressed through observational studies, um, observational studies that are very large and with high contrast and independent variables and have good measurement quality can provide valuable evidence. And the existence of the exposed populations offers opportunities to utilize non-experimental methods. Uh, and we should be documenting these exposures that we that are taking place in, in the workplaces. So another point to remember uh, is that RCTs are often either not feasible or not ethical. So to assess the health effects of factors uh, to which people are already being exposed, such as the environment or in the workplace. Uh, and while fortunately no one seems to be pro proposing that we should be randomly assigning uh, large groups of new workers to different levels of durations of things like heavy lifting or whole body vibration, the lack of the st such studies does seem to be precisely uh, the research gap that some point to as the critical gap in our knowledge. So just understanding that, you know, some of these research, you, you can't set up an RCT where people are lifting 100 pounds over their head as many times throughout the day as they can to see, you know, what the thresholds are. Uh, or, or over time, sorry, if you're going to do that to somebody over their whole work career. So just going over, over it, uh, at present, the conclusions of the IIAC and NIOSH before them is that epicondylitis can be caused by occupational factors, uh, and that appears to be valid. The available evidence suggests that definitely repeatedly forceful work carries the largest associated risk. Uh, and although the actual muscles and movements involved obviously differ, it would seem likely that the evidence and um, would apply equally to both lateral and medial epicondylitis. So given that it's a widely accepted degenerative nature of the condition, it is clear that the repeated challenges would be expected to play a role and the concept of micro tears implies a load related contribution uh, as modest forces would be expected to be less likely to cause injury. A dynamic posture movement uh, will add a further dimension with the muscles origins perhaps more likely to be stressed with movements towards the limit of the normal range. What is less clear in drawing such conclusions is that the degree of force required and the associated uh, with that force, the extent of any repetition necessary. So although logic suggests that higher forces and greater degrees of, rep of repetition will present higher risk, it seems likely that there will be some form of interplay between the two. However, the precise relationship remains to be determined. So however, it, it would make sense to approach epicondylitis from um, you know, a safety perspective and thinking of the mechanisms that could cause it uh, in the workplace uh, and, and really dealing with a combination of factors. So if you see this list at the bottom of this page here, so force, uh, posture, inadequate recovery time, vibration, uh, and combination effects, and with the bullet points having more specific to epicondylitis and how to, to reduce those. So taking a more holistic approach in the workplace and, and, and trying to reduce them all knowing that they all work in combination. So overall, we want to decrease the external forces wherever possible in, in you know, whatever way that you can, that doesn't add any more strain to your, your elbows. We want to design the work ergonomically to reduce the strain on your arms and elbows. Uh, things like decreasing the gripping forces could be important, uh, reducing the weight of the object uh, and increasing the grip of the object. Okay, so we can see things like tools that uh, have balancers that can hang and, and take the weight off. So you don't need to hold the weight of the object and grip it uh, or dollies or things like that. Okay, we wanna limit the reaching and pay attention to the grip design. Uh, overall, we want to attempt to do work in neutral postures with the hand and wrist. And we see that the hand is gonna be you know, at its strongest in that with that wrist at a neutral posture. Uh, and this is a common ergonomics work organization chart. And the idea is that you want to design work as, as much as possible to be in that primary zone and to limit reaching out to the tertiary zone as much as possible. 
We also want to improve the repetition rate uh, or the work to rest ratios. So we want to minimize the repetitive arm movements with inadequate rest time, especially if they involve forceful gripping and twisting. We we get this question a lot. Uh, you know, it's how much how much repetition. I kind of went over this already, but generally the answer is it depends. It depends on the repetition rate, the forces involved, postures involved, uh, and remembering it's a combination of these factors and the individual factors as well that contribute to how how much force is placed on the elbow. Okay, and then you could potentially do something like assess the work. Uh, with Rula to see how much arm movement there is. Uh, maybe you have changes to the job and you want to reassess it. Well, it's not directly linked to epicondylitis. Uh, it's just another way of, of summarizing some of the, the demands. Okay, and we also want to try and reduce or eliminate exposure to vibration. So different tool designs or, or things like gloves. Um, interestingly, though, with, with gloves, you also have to think about the fact that, you know, the, the thicker the gloves that you're wearing, uh, the harder that you're going to be squeezing, and then, and when doing so, the the more force that you're going to be using through your forearms. And just to go over two workers' compensation cases, and I, you know, I honestly thought I was going in. I would see, um, you know, based on the the literature that the forces were always, you know, with with NIOSH having force and repetition linked together. I thought that's what I'd be finding, but I, I actually found two uh, opposite ones where I found. Um, in the first one here, the panel considered a medical opinion suggesting that low strain from holding a sign. Um, so, so basically, the person uh, had a sign they were they're waving over their head, um, and the panel against them said, "You know, we we've shown that holding this is actually low strain, but they recognized that the worker's repetitive waving of the sign caused her left elbow condition over time, and this aligned with the doctor's explanation of the repetitive elbow and wrist motions causing epicondylitis." And the panel concluded that the workers duties supported this description, providing evidence for entitlement to compensation. Uh, and then in the 2nd, 1 here, the panel found no evidence uh, of alternative causes or non work related activities overshadowing the workplace incident as the cause of the workers elbow condition. And they were confident based on the balance of probabilities that the, that the accident that they had at work. Uh, either caused or significantly contributed to the worker's left lateral epicondylitis. So I just thought that one was interesting because it also involved uh, an accident, and but it's a cumulative injury, and they're and they're factoring that in there. Okay, and just if you wanted to go deeper dive into to the references um, that I use for most of the content uh, there there as well. If you have any questions or comments, thanks, Daryl. You end my show here. Actually, Daryl, uh, Dr. Mike just. Uh, joined on as well. Oh, great. So you're not alone anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So please feel free to post any questions of for Daryl, as well as the other presenters in the chat. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, but to start off with for the questions specific for Daryl or, or Mike, uh, can prolonged use that created epicondylitis cause pain into the shoulder area, supraspinatus muscle, or even the clavicle? Uh, yeah, I can try to answer that, Daryl. Yeah, okay. hi. Uh, it's it's Mike Sklavitz. I'm uh, one of the physicians at OCAL, sort of joined so late. Um, with, I, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Will uh, lateral epicondylitis cause more proximal pain in the shoulder? Is that the just yeah, the question? Yeah, so prolonged use that created epicondylitis cause pain into the shoulder, supraspinatus muscles, or even the clavicle? Yeah, by indirect ways, I'm sure it could. It's just, you know, the, the, the typical sort of uh, favoring the joint and causing more um, uh, altered biomechanics essentially on the shoulder. So if you're, you know, relying on your elbow or not relying on your elbow to do the normal work, then there's going to be ex some extension of forces in another direction uh, upon the shoulder. There wouldn't be a direct association because mechanically, you know, it's it's the the, the issue, as Daryl pointed out, is an enthesopathy at the elbow. So that that muscle group, the extensor muscle group, is starting at the lateral epicondyle. So it doesn't mechanically meet up with the shoulder. But yes, indirectly, there will just be altered biomechanics favoring the shoulder to potentially cause that. Good question. Okay. The next question is, is there any evidence of using collagen supplement to aid in the healing of tendinosis? And if so, is there a recommended daily intake? Uh, that's a good question. I 
am not aware of that in the literature. I'm sure there must be some studies. Uh, they wouldn't be very strong if they're out there because I'm not specifically aware of that. Theoretically, would that provide something, uh, some benefit? I suppose so, but the issue is not so much the amount of collagen. So, you know, theoretically, I mean, sorry, and I'm just speaking off the top of my head here. Um, I would guess that I, that biomechanically, I, I, I'm, or mechanistically, I'm not sure it would make a difference actually. Um, but sorry, I just can't answer whether there's epidemiology. I haven't actually searched for that yet. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how about acupuncture for treatment? Yeah, acupuncture, that's a good question. Both acupuncture and physio, that there is some evidence that it might be beneficial for lateral epicondylitis. But like uh, Daryl probably highlighted, the epidemiology is all over there. And in general, uh, I or, uh, it, it's, it's equivocal. And in general as well, from a clinical perspective, I don't typically refer people for either of those modalities. I just find that for the time expense, it's actually not all that beneficial for lateral epicondylitis. Okay. Do our bands decrease blood flow and decrease healing? Uh, this is based on someone's uh, occupational therapist telling them this. They wanna know, is this true? And also, are there certain forearm bands that they should be used as opposed to not used? Uh, that's a really good question. Classically, so what, what the, the person is referring to are these forearm straps are commonly um, marketed for lateral epicondylitis. Uh, and we use them all the time. Do they help? It's really variable, actually. Um, we don't universally recommend them, and it's sort of, uh, if it helps you, go for it. And the issue, as, as the, the questioner is sort of pointing out, is how much tension do you put on these things? And can it cause uh, impairment of the, the vasculature of the form? Yeah, it can, actually. You can just over-tighten the thing. Um, so you have to instruct the person to use it for, for comfort. There's actually a little bit more literature recognizing the fact that wrist splints are even better than these elbow straps. The epidemiology for the elbow, uh, sorry, for the forearm straps. The epidemiology for forearm straps isn't great, there's this actually a stronger literature that holding the wrist in a neutral position, that is, you know, the clinical, uh, our typical sort of uh, carpal tunnel splints are even more helpful. And it's understandable. What they're doing is they're holding your wrist in a neutral po posture and preventing the flexion extension movements that are uh, instigating the lateral epicondylitis. So I hope that sort of answered the question, but it's a very good question and there's uh, not a great answer to that. Okay. Um, the next question I think is more geared towards Daryl. Can office work using a mouse, keyboard, et cetera, lead to epicondylitis for some people? Um, well, it, it certainly has some risk factors in there. If, you know, I've seen cases where uh, somebody has the mouse and the keyboard on different levels. So they have a, a small keyboard tray and then their keyboards on there and then they have the mouse up on their desk. And, and they're every single time they go to use their mouse, they're extending and, and reaching in, in that pronated posture. Uh, so some things like that, sure. Um, you know, there's also other risk factors like the, the cubital tunnel syndrome. If you're leaning hard on, on your elbows and pushing down on those pressure points, um, but uh, but yeah, certainly if you're if you're constantly extending your arm like that, uh, and then also the you know the wrist and the fingers are, are so active with typing. That's Mike. What would be the number one early warning sign before ser serious uh, damage can happen? Um, first warning sign clinically. Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, lateral epicondylitis is almost exclusively pain, so I guess you just have to focus on that, and it's just the degree of pain. But I think more important than that is uh, serious damage, and that's the sort of elusive one and hard one with lateral epicondylitis. As it turns out, almost always, and Daryl, I think, might have, might have mentioned this, almost always the natural progression is that it, it heals in virtually everybody. So it's, it's kind of funny to say, but it doesn't typically progress, uh, progress to serious damage that is something surgical or something longstanding. Almost invariably, it heals up. So it's one of those funny ones that kind of solves itself a lot. And so, you know, I find the biggest treatment for most people is education for these things. And that's, you know, when I see the person for the first time with this condition, it's to say, 
Okay, you got this uh, tendonitis or enthesopathy at your elbow. You're in it for the long haul, and it's two to 12 months, but give it time, it will go away. And that's correct, probably about 98% of the time that it does go away on its own. Okay, question is, when is the injection of corticosteroids most effective? Corticosteroids aren't extremely effective. I guess it would be, I would use them, or rarely recommend them, but when I do, it's for this sort of um, persisting cases. And I would typically tell someone that we're not even considering it before six months. So it'd be for the severe long-standing ones. Corticosteroids have proven to be pretty disappointing actually in lateral epicondylitis, that there seems to be some immediate benefit for perhaps short-term, but longer-term, they don't have great, great outcomes. So it's not quite as universally used as other conditions like, uh, like a tendonitis in the shoulder, for instance. How long can it take to go away if you keep working with what caused it? Um, good, good question. That's very hard to answer. Um, again, it's one of those ones where the natural history is it goes away and I, it is one of those conditions where I tell people to stick with work. It sounds funny, um, but I tell people usually, you know, walk, operate at about 60, 60 to 70% speed. So sort of dial back your activities, but continue to work actually, as opposed to some other conditions where you want total rest. I've not found that total rest on the elbow helps. In fact, I find it kind of harmful. So you sort of have to find that perfect balance of doing too much and too little. And so how long does can work take or how long will it take if you continue to work? Well, it's really variable. And again, the natural history is sort of like two to 12 months. Okay. And uh, do you see the list of conventional treatment procedures help in the case of RSIs in terms of epicondylitis as well? Yeah, I'm not sure. Generally, uh, probably, I, I think they're a little, I, I'm not sure what list it's referring to, but. I think that the conventional things for us, RSIs are actually a little less effective for lateral epicondylitis. So again, the treatment such as corticosteroids, not great with lateral epicondylitis. Now, and I, and I saw a comment about the, the acupuncture that it did help you. Remember, I'm just saying these as generalities, but absolutely, like some, some of these treatments will help with people. But in general, I think they're less effective for lateral epicondylitis, which as Daryl said, is probably more mechanical as opposed to inflammatory yet for most cases and, and settles down with time. Okay, perfect. So the questions, Dr. Mike and Daryl, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you also to all our other presenters today. Thank you for you for joining us. We'll see you again next week.